Your past can no longer hold your future hostage. Welcome to Revival Today. What's up, this is Jonathan Shuttlesworth, and I want to welcome you to what is one of the greatest privileges of my life, the ability to sit here and broadcast to America, Africa, the United Kingdom. I want to welcome you wherever you're watching, and I want you to know it's not a coincidence that you tuned into this program. Wherever you are, I want you to get ready for God to touch you. As I was driving to the studio today, I was thinking back on two services that we had where one of them, a lady got touched in the meeting in Allentown, Pennsylvania, she had a cataract in her eye, and the cataract came out of her eye and melted down her cheek. When we got home that night, there was a message in our ministry email that a lady watching the live stream in Toronto, she, sent a, she tweeted us a picture, actually, of the, her cataract on her finger, not knowing what had happened to that lady. The God that touched the woman in Allentown, Pennsylvania, simultaneously touched the lady in Toronto of the same thing. We had a similar story outside of Pittsburgh, there was a lady that got called out in the meeting. The power of God touched her. But when the power of God hit her, she put her hand on her breast, believing for God to touch her friend in Nigeria that had uh, severe breast cancer. She got the call a couple days later that the cancer was totally gone. God is not limited by anything, including time and distance. You're going to see God touch people in the service we're about to take you into. But I want you to know, the same God that touches them, he didn't touch them because they were in that building. He touched them because they heard the Word of God, believed the Word of God, and God responds to faith. That's why we do this show. We have no ulterior motives. We want God's power to deliver you from every oppression of the devil, and I believe that's going to happen tonight. I'm so glad you tuned in. Keep it locked right here. Enjoy the meeting. I'll be back with you at the end to pray. You are watching Revival Today. The Bible says, Later Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, his disciples came to him privately and said, tell us when will all this happen? And what sign will signal your return and the end of the world? Jesus told them, don't let anyone mislead you. For many will come in my name claiming I'm the Messiah. They will deceive many. And you'll hear of wars and threats of wars. But don't panic. Yes, these things must take place. But the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. But all this is only the first of birth pains with more to come. Then you'll be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You'll be hated all over the world because of your allegiance to me or because you're my followers. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere and the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end shall be saved. And the gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it. Then the end shall come. For the sake of time, skip to verse 32. This is still Jesus on the same discourse. Now learn a lesson from the fig tree. When its branches bud and its leaves begin to sprout, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things begin to happen, you can know my return is near even at the door. I tell you the truth. This generation will not pass from the scene until all these things are fulfilled. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will remain forever. However, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen. Not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. 
In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up till the time Noah entered his boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. That is the way it'll be when the Son of Man comes. Two men will be working together in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding flour at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. 42. So you too must keep watch, for you don't know the day your Lord is coming. Understand this. If a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into. You also must be ready all the time, for the Son of Man will come when least expected. A faithful, sensible servant is one to whom the master can give the responsibility of managing the other household servants and feeding them. If the master returns and find that the servant has done a good job, there'll be a reward. I tell you the truth, the master will put that servant in charge of all he owns. But what if the servant is evil and thinks my master won't be back for a while and he begins beating the other servants, parting and getting drunk? The master will return unannounced and unexpected and he will cut the servant to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites in the place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Turn over to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation 20. Verse 11, Revelation 20, 11. And I saw a great white throne and the one sitting on it. The earth and sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. And I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. And the books were opened, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead. And death in the grave, or the sea gave up its dead, and death in the grave gave up their dead. And all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. I read four, yeah, relative to the rest of the Bible, pretty brief <laughs> passages of Scripture that outline what the Bible says is a prophetic timeline, that the Bible already outlines what's going to happen, that right now we are in a period of time where the next event on God's prophetic calendar is known as the rapture of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you Google that event, you'll find that a lot of religious people will say something like, that's something that was invented in the 1800s. Saying that the rapture was invented in the 1800s is like saying speaking in tongues was invented by Pentecostals in 1900. These are events that Paul said, writing back to the church in Thessalonica. Let me tell you again, brothers and sisters, like I told you before, about the coming of the Lord. You know, every time I ever mention this, people that had their loved ones cremated always think I'm preaching against cremation. But I'm not doing it for that reason. I'm trying to get you to understand why, unlike in Asia, unlike in, in India, we don't cremate or burn bodies. God buried Moses. But if you ever heard the term a proper Christian burial, when I went to my grandfather's funeral, after he had preached the gospel for 62 years, went home to be with the Lord, they gave him what would be called a proper Christian burial, where they put you in your Sunday suit, holding your Bible, had him laying there just like he was ready to preach. Why did Christians begin to bury like that? Paul said, brethren, we don't mourn like those that have no hope. In fact, he said in 1 Corinthians 15, if there be no resurrection of the dead, we are the most miserable of all people. This earth is not our home. The Bible says there's an eternal home for those that have made their lives right with Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. There is a real place called heaven that is the dwelling place. Every one of your grandparents, every member of your family you've had who's made a decision to make Jesus Christ their, their Lord. They're not dead. They're not, they're not 
an angel watching over you, they are in the presence of the Lord. And one day, if your name's written in that book called the Lamb's Book of Life, you'll be together with them. If you've never made your arrangements, that's what we've been holding these meetings for. So you can know for sure that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life and you're ready to meet the Lord when he comes. If you're ready, take 20 seconds, clap those hands and shout under the Most High God. One thing I love about the Bible, among many things, is the Bible. The Bible says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Not only does it teach you how to live day-to-day living, the Bible is one-third, that's a lot, one-third prophecy. One-third of the Bible is the Holy Ghost moving on men, God appearing to them directly an angel appearing. God knows the future better than we know the past. I mean, even in the book of Acts, Paul's on a ship. The ship's captain, everybody on it thinks they're going to die. Paul comes out the next day and says, the angel, brethren, eat something. Don't be afraid. For the angel of the Lord has appeared to me and told me, this ship is not, though the ship's going to be lost, God, for your sake being with me, he's going to spare every one of your lives. God knows the future. And when you spend time with God and spend time in his word, his word is a lamp under your feet. If you notice one of the things that our culture has right now, Nobody knows what's going on. As they've rejected the Bible, you just turn on one news show after another. What's the economy going to do? What's the, what's the world going to do? What's going to happen with ISIS? What's happening right now? It's all speculation. But the Bible doesn't speculate about the future. The Bible tells you with a surety what's going to happen. And it's a, a great book. The Bible mentions several events there. Number one is what we call the rapture of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. What's referred to specifically in the Bible as the great catching away. That the next thing that's to happen, Paul said, there will be a trumpet sound from heaven and a call of God. The dead in Christ shall rise. That's why they bury Christians like that, ready to meet the Lord. And then in the twinkling of an eye, We that are alive and remain. So I want you to notice, the Bible doesn't say there's going to be a collapse of the world and then the rapture. The Bible, in fact, Jesus said, in that day, it'll be like it was in the days of Noah. Men will be farming and building, buying and selling. So there isn't going to be some great collapse ahead of time to signal these things. He said, we that are alive and remain which means there'll be people that are alive. Jesus went on to say it. He said, two will be at work at the mill. Back then it was flour mill. Here it would be steel mill. Whatever, gas field. Wherever you're watching on TV, whatever you do. The Bible says there'll be a separation at that point where those that have made things right with God, one will be taken and the other will be left. Two women will be together, one taken, one left. A man sleeping. Two married, a married couple. One taken, one left. You know they're married or they both would have been left if they're sleeping in the same bed. Jesus said that day will come like a thief. There's not going to be some great prophetic in the sky warning. You have to study the word of God and be ready. I preached on it last night trying to preach on something else. It's like no matter what I start on, I keep going back to this because the Bible says, brethren, the coming of the Lord is sooner now than when you first believed. One one difference you notice about the modern church compared, and I don't mean the ancient church, I'm talking when my grandfather preached, when Pastor Getchell's father preached. This was not a side issue. This is one of the four foundational truths of almost every church that that sprang up in the late 1800s on. The imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not a side issue. So the Bible talks about the rapture, the next prophetic event, where there will be a catching away of about 500 million people that are saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, living free from sin, keeping their garments white. The Bible says they'll be caught up off the earth The dead in Christ will rise. Then we that are alive and remain will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. Then 
there shall we ever be. Can you say amen? There will be a ruler who is not going to be named Antichrist. The Bible calls him Antichrist because he'll set himself against everything that Jesus was. Claiming to be the Messiah, he'll actually be what the Bible calls the man of lawlessness and the man of wickedness. And notice what it says. That spirit that's going to be embodied in a man is already at work in the world now secretly. But it can't do what it wants until he that is in the way is removed. The he, what's the he? Who's the he that's hindering that spirit from doing its work? The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is not under the dominion of the Antichrist. We are what is preventing the devil from doing what he wants to do on the earth. And that's why we've been in three weeks of meetings to let the devil know we're still here and we're going to do what Jesus called us to do. If you're one of those, let God know he still has an army. Clap those hands. Can you say amen? amen? So you have the rapture. The rapture is Jesus coming for the church. Then after we're caught up, the Bible talks about a one world ruler called Antichrist, that there'll be a one world government, the United Nations, all these things. You have to understand, after the rapture, it's not like the Antichrist is going to, you know, the world's going to say, listen, give us 20 years to get everything set up and then we, can, then we can get this thing going. The structure is in place now for all of these things that the Bible talked about to just be ready when the rapture happens. So the United Nations, you never had anything like that in world history where there's already a council that meets in New York to decide world policy. It's the forerunner for it. After the church leaves, you're going to have a man rise to power who's going to rule over all the world. The Bible says he'll be given dominion over everyone on this earth. His rule will last seven years. That culminates in a battle called Armageddon, which I'll get into. And at that battle of Armageddon is when you have what's called the second coming of Jesus Christ. The rapture and the second coming are two different things. The rapture is the catching away. Jesus never touches the ground. They are caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. So shall they ever be. But the second coming is Christ not coming for the church. Christ coming back with the church to set up a kingdom on this earth of which there will be no end. And I'm planning on coming with him. How about you? I wanted you to notice that the disciples said, Jesus, we know from the, the prophets that there's an end of the world coming. And then, of course, to go after, I mean, we, we read it already. Then what happens after Armageddon? What happens after Christ comes back with the church and sets up a kingdom? You have the millennial reign of Christ that then culminates in the sea giving up all of its dead and death in the grave giving up all their dead. And every person who ever lived will stand before the Lord to be judged in any name. And how will they be judged? According to their heart? No. According to what they had done. The Bible says every man's deeds were recorded in the book. And they all gave an account for what they've done. And one book's open called the Lamb's Book of Life, which is the registry of every person who's repented of sin and made Jesus Christ their Lord and Savior. 
And I guess, sadly, I've got to take time to do this. Jesus is the only way to heaven. Apparently now people go to Bible college for too long and start being unable to understand John chapter 14, verse 6, where Jesus said, I am not a way, not I am a truth, not I am a life. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. I am the door. Muhammad asked his followers to lay down their lives for him. Jesus said, I have come to lay down my life for you as a ransom for many. (laughs) Jesus said, I know these things are hard for you to understand. So I'm going to give you a sign. I will have this temple torn down, but my father will give me power to raise it back up again. A rumor started that he was plotting to destroy the temple in Jerusalem, but he was talking about the temple of his body. And the, you know, like my science teacher said when I was in high school, well, you know, you have to understand, I don't believe the Bible. Along with evolution, this falls into that as well. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is not Bible history. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is world history. And the Bible says on the third day after he died, Jesus said, I'm going to, anybody can claim to be the Messiah. Jesus said, before I come back, many will rise up and say I'm the Messiah. But I'm going to give you a proof that no one else can give. Three days after I lay this temple down, my father will give me power to raise it back up again on the third day. Now, the religious leaders, demonically inspired, knew that Jesus said he was going to rise from the dead. So what did they do? They didn't just bury him. They put him in a tomb and sealed it with a giant rock. Then they commissioned a battalion, not one, not two Pinkerton security guards, a battalion of Roman soldiers who anytime they were under orders to guard anything, if you failed to guard it, you paid with your life. You don't have one guy. You, I mean, you talk about the power of prophecy that the devil knew what was getting ready to happen. And so you have 20 some people guarding a dead body. What are you guys guarding that for? We're going to make sure he doesn't move. You should already know you have somebody special on your hands at that point. And so there they are outside of the tomb. But the Bible says, an angel of the Lord appeared. All 20 of them fell and scattered. And the angel rolled the stone aside. So the women come, arguing amongst themselves, getting ready to anoint his body according to Jewish burial customs. Who are we going to get to roll the stone away? When they get to the tomb, they find the stone has already been rolled away. Just then a man, who she thought was the gardener, said, who are you looking for? Whom seek ye? Jesus of Nazareth, she said. They have taken away my Lord. But that man that she thought was the gardener was an angel of the Lord. And he made one of the best proclamations that have ever been made. Why seek ye the living among the dead? For the Jesus that you're looking for is not dead. He is alive and he lives forevermore. Now go tell everybody. Jonathan Shuttlesworth, back live with you. And if you're still watching till this point, I trust God got a hold of your heart. You know, the Bible says in Acts 10, 38, Acts chapter 10, verse 38, and no doubt you know how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all, that's everyone, who was oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Notice those two words that are used in that verse, healing and oppression. Every sickness and disease is covered in healing, and all demonic oppression, drug addiction, depression, anything that's tormenting your life like that, the Bible says Jesus healed every one of those things, that they don't come from God, they came from the devil. Everyone that's watching, I mean, I'm amazed at how many heroin addicts watch our program and have written into us these last two years. Prescription pill addicts, it's running rampant through this country. But the same Jesus that delivered from oppressions then, he'll set you free tonight. And I believe that's why God kept you watching to this point. I want you right in your room. We're not going to keep you in prayer. We're going to pray right now 
and the power of God's going to break that bondage over your life. Go ahead and lift your hands and close your eyes. And as I pray, the presence of God's going to come in your room and the Lord's going to set you free from those afflictions. Father, every person that you've drawn their eyes to this TV set, I thank you that you drew them so that you could set them free. As they've believed the word of God they've heard preached, I thank you that now your power is going to touch them and make them free. Every foul spirit of oppression, every tormenting sickness and disease, every heroin addiction, every prescription pill addiction that's represented in the sound of my voice, I curse you in the name of Jesus Christ, and I command those watching to be set free now by the power of God. Cancer, HIV, AIDS, I command you to bow your knee to the name of Jesus Christ. And I thank you, Father, that you pick them up out of that pit and set their feet on the rock to stay, and today they're free. I command you to be set free and healed in the mighty name of Jesus Christ where you are right now, in Jesus' name. Wherever you are, you can just begin to thank God that you're free, that the power of God is working through your body, making you new. The Bible says if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The old life is dead. Everything that goes with the old life's dead. All things become new. Secondly, there's many of you watching, you've never given your life to Jesus Christ. You need to do that right now. The most important thing in all the world is to know that you're right with God, that you're headed to heaven and not hell. So I'm going to lead you in this prayer. This one I want you to say out loud with me, and God's going to rewrite your story right now. Say this, Dear Heavenly Father, I'm sorry for my sins. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for restoring me. I believe in my heart. You raised Jesus from the dead. I confess with my mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord and my Savior. Say this, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Fill me with your power. Where I was weak, make me strong. I am yours. In Jesus' name, amen. You prayed that prayer with me. Your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You're saved. You're born again. Your sins are forgiven. What I want you to do now is go to our website. You see it at the bottom of the screen, revivaltoday.com. And there's a tab that says, that will be the first one you see. It says, I just got saved. Click on that, fill out your information, and when you do, I'm going to send you a gift absolutely free. I want to put this in your hand. It's a two-disc set that I've made just for those of you that pray with us called Things That Come With Salvation. When you get saved, everything changes. But if you don't know what changes, it doesn't do you much good. So I'm going to show you out of the Bible how things are going to be different now. And I promise you, everything will be different now. So right now, go to our webpage, revivaltoday.com, click on I just got saved and fill that out. Do it right now. Don't put it off five minutes. Right now, I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Wherever you are, I can't wait to read what you have to say. I am Jonathan Shuttlesworth. I'll see you next week. You've been watching Revival Today. We want to keep in touch with you and so into your life by giving you a completely free gift. You don't even have to pay shipping. Just go to our website, revivaltoday.com. And remember, God loves you and we love you.